This week, we'll begin our discussion of The Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald's most famous novel, one of the most famous American novels, as we've discussed before, right up there with Huckleberry Finn and uh, some of the other ones. And like I mentioned last week, uh, in last week's lecture, we'll see a lot of the uh, similar themes reappearing in this book that we saw Fitzgerald exploring in his short stories. The idea of the American dream, uh, what it means to live it, how it can be good, and that it seems to promise that anybody can rise from nothing and become somebody, uh, and how the American dream can be bad uh, by leading to hedonism, uh, to materialism, and disillu disillusionment ultimately when the dream isn't met or when it's not what we expected it to be. The book also explores the barrier that class and wealth put between two individuals who otherwise may have had a happy, healthy relationship, as we saw happening in Winter Dreams. And finally, it'll, it will focus on uh, the importance of appearances. Everybody in this novel is presenting some sort of a front or a mask to the world uh, and hiding their true feelings and their secrets within. It's hard to come away from a reading of the novel and see any of the characters as looking entirely innocent or spotless. So it's kind of pessimistic in that way. Then again, uh, that might be uh, because of the narrator and his perspective. Uh, the novel is narrated uh, in the first person by a man named Nick Carraway. He's from the Midwest. He's a World War I veteran. And he's now trying to get into the finance game, trying to be a stockbroker. And the story opens by him uh, giving a description of himself and of his personality uh, to us, the readers. And he says that the most important thing to know about him is that he's non-judgmental. That after some advice that his father gave him when he was young, he's always tried to reserve criticizing people too harshly because he can't possibly know what they've been through or what they're currently uh, going through. So he's an appropriate protagonist uh, for a story that takes place in this age of loosening morals and secrets and uh, in some cases debauchery. And because of this quality of his, uh, he says that he's sort of a magnet uh, for people to come to and unburden their problems on. Uh, they make him their confidant uh, because they know that he won't judge them too harshly. And he's right about this. He's not just bragging about himself because we can see it happening even in the opening chapters of this story. But he also says that there's a limit to his tolerance. And then he announces that he's going to be relating uh, the time in his life where that limit was reached. He says, When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, uh, that's going back to that idea of appearances again, appearances being everything. Uh, are, is our personality really just the gestures that we put out for the world to see? If personality is, a, is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby. What foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. So, 
he's saying he's had an experience that's temporarily left him disgusted uh, with society and with mankind in general. Uh, He just wants to close himself out from the rest of the world. And that only this one person, uh, Gatsby, was exempt from that disgust. He mentions Gats- he mentions uh, Gatsby's capacity to hope, uh, which is an important point, uh, and his capacity to dream, uh, another big point. Remember again the comparisons that we're uh, going to be making between this novel and the short story Winter Dreams. And he says that he's never really met another person like him. It's an interesting way to begin the story, though, I think, by insisting so much on his own moral superiority to whatever it was that he's experienced. We don't have any reason to mistrust him here. Uh, Maybe he will be the kind of good narrator uh, that we would expect from a non-judgmental, objective uh, person. Uh, That, you know, the sort of narration we would expect from them. But also remember that he's a character as well as a narrator in this story. And we should keep in mind all of what we've already talked about in the past, all of what we've learned about unreliable narrators, how we have to take their narrations with a grain of salt. Uh, Keep all that in mind as we progress. So, Nick lives in New York, on Long Island, uh, in a fictional neighborhood called West Egg. Uh, We learned that this is a neighborhood where a lot of the new money people live. Uh, He rents a small house, which happens to be next door to this giant mansion, which we learn later on uh, is owned by uh, Gatsby. Now, across the bay from West Egg is another neighborhood called East Egg. And this is where uh, people from a background of generational and established wealth live. His cousin, Daisy Buchanan, lives over there uh, with her husband, Tom. And Nick is invited over to dine with them, and he gets a sense of uh, what they're like during this dinner. Uh, They've just had a child, uh, but their marriage is apparently very unhappy. Tom has a mistress who isn't discreet at all. She's actually calling to talk to him while they're all sitting down to dinner. And while she can probably safely assume that Daisy's at home, she just doesn't care. And Daisy is very unhappy, uh, despite her apparent popularity and beauty. Uh, She's definitely a type of the 1920s uh, flapper, uh, a socialite who's friends with all the right people, uh, the famous people in the city. Uh, One of her friends is a famous golf player uh, named Jordan Baker, uh, who's there too. And the depiction of her at first isn't flattering either. She's very aloof. Uh, she She seems very full of herself. And she also seems to be a bit addicted to gossip. She's actually the one who tells Nick about the Buchanans' marital troubles when Tom's mistress is calling. Uh, she's trying to listen into what's happening and telling Nick to Shh, hush up. I want, I want to overhear this. Now, Tom, uh, he's a hypocritical character. He's from a very wealthy family, and he was a famous. Co- he was famous in college as a football player, uh, and he says at dinner that he's concerned about how civilization has gone to pieces. And we know uh, from the discussions that we've had already that this was a common view among the more traditional thinkers during this jazz age, uh, for, uh, d- among the more conservative thinkers. But Tom doesn't seem to realize that he's contributing to the degeneracy of the age. Uh, He's cheating on his wife uh, with a woman named Myrtle Wilson, who's also married. Uh, He's a heavy drinker, and he actually owns a flat in the city uh, so that he and Myrtle can get away from their spouses and live lives of debauchery on their own in secret. Uh, So despite his complaints, he's not very traditional at all. If society's falling to pieces, he, he's contributing his fair share. Uh, but instead, uh, he blames the breakdown of civilization on other races. He's apparently been drawn into believing some version of uh, white supremacy, uh, though it's not clear how much he actually understands of the ideology. Uh, Daisy even makes fun of uh, his pretension on the subject, saying that he's gotten so profound by reading books with long words in them. 
So with a social circle like this, uh, we might, as readers, be led to pity Daisy a bit. Uh, she certainly wants Nick to pity her. But we're warned, we're, we're warned by Nick uh, that even though she's acting so cynical and sad and depressed, he thinks it's all a show on her part uh, to extract some kind of pity or some, side, some, uh, some kind of uh, emotion out of him. Uh, so there are shades of hypocrisy about her character as well, even though she does seem to be living this uh, unfulfilled life. And so the promise we got in the opening pages about Nick being disgusted with a whole lot of humanity, uh, with all of their dishonesty and immorality, it seems to already be coming true. Uh, we're going to see uh, unpleasant characters here. In chapter 3, though, uh, the subject and the tone of the novel shifts. Nick gets invited to one of his neighbor Gatsby's parties, uh, and when he goes, he finds out that he's one of the very few people who actually got an invitation. Everybody else just shows up. <laughs> uh, Gatsby's mansion is apparently taken for granted as a place for all of the rich people, all of the cool people, uh, to be at. Every weekend, he throws these elaborate parties with music, dancing, alcohol, everything that we might expect from a party in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, but this is excessive, uh, even by the standards of the Twenties. And I think uh, we might think back to how so many people at this time were suddenly coming into a lot of wealth really quickly. And then think about how people who have grown up with no money are likely to behave if a bunch of it is suddenly dumped into their laps at once. Uh, this is the sort of a party or bash uh, that the respectable, established old money types would probably never throw. Uh, but plenty of them don't mind showing up, since it's all on the tab of what they assume is some young fool who doesn't know how to invest properly and who's just burning through all of his uh, newfound money. Uh, there are other indications, too, that Gatsby is somebody who's only recently come into means. Uh, we get a glimpse of his library, uh, which is full of books that are real, uh, but the pages aren't broken open yet. Uh, printers back in this era sometimes didn't cut the pages, uh, but left it for the buyer to do. If you ever pick up an old book to this day in an antique shop or, uh, or somewhere like that, you might find a book like this. Uh, you would buy a book that's essentially this block, and then you had to uh, cut the pages apart with a, with a pen knife or something. And this tells us two things. Uh, one, that Gatsby isn't entirely a hypocrite. Uh, the bookshelves aren't fake, uh, and the books on them aren't hollow or made out of cardboard. They're not decorations. But it also tells us that he hasn't had time to seriously sit down with these real books and improve himself by reading them. You know, one other thing, uh, one other indication that he might have just newly become successful and wealthy is that uh, when we meet him, we notice that his mannerisms seem rehearsed uh, and put on. As if he's saying what he thinks the rich elite class would say, uh, talking how he thinks they would talk, not uh, what's really coming natural to him to say. So again, all these are indications that he's uh, newly arrived onto the scene of the rich and the powerful and the wealthy. Uh, but despite all of this, nobody seems to actually know who Gatsby is. Nobody has a close personal relationship with him. Nick is trying to find out. He's saying, well, we're all here at his house. You people come all the time. Uh, how is it that nobody actually knows him? Because Nick's actually trying to be polite and greet his host, and nobody else seems concerned about doing so. And he hears all sorts of wild rumors about Gatsby's history, uh, about whether or not he was a German spy, about how he came into all of his wealth, and they all seem to be uh, the extravagant sort of tales uh, that uh, grow in the telling. Uh, there might be some grain of truth to them, but they're all spun wildly out of proportion. And Nick doesn't put much stock in them. 
And then he realizes that he's been having a conversation with Gatsby at a table, and he didn't know it was him until finally uh, they introduce themselves. And Nick likes him right away, uh, even though he's still something of a mysterious character. And Gatsby uh, seems to like him, too. He invites him to hang out on the water, out on the bay, uh, the very next day. We'll find out in next week's readings why Gatsby is so interested in Nick. Uh, I guess, you know, sure, he's a friendly guy. You know, invite your neighbor over. Uh, He doesn't, I'm not saying he has some evil ulterior motive uh, for wanting to get to know Nick. Uh, But he does have an ulterior motive. So, for next time, read chapters uh, 4 through 6, and we'll take it from there. Thanks.